years ago, I had the good fortune to, uh, to get to work on the Iron Giant uh, as a supervising animator. And uh, the, thing, the one thing I'm going to say is that when we were making this movie, uh, we really had the, the, the feeling that we were doing something a little bit special, that was pushing the envelope and like going down a new road for animation. And then you know, the movie came out and it was not immediately a hit. Uh, so we're like, okay, I guess it was just us. But then, 20 years later, you know, I'm looking at this room and I know it was not just us. It was really, it was, you know, what we were feeling, you know, I'm so glad that people are feeling the same way now. So, there you go. So, the way I like to do this panel is I'm just going to give you a little bit of my background and tell you how I got involved with the Iron Giant uh, and how the movie kind of came to be. Uh, and, but very quickly, I'm just going to open up to questions and, uh, and we'll take it from there because I know that people have a lot of questions. So, um, so yeah, about 20 years ago, I was working in Warner Brothers uh, feature animation. Uh, I just recently moved from France and uh, uh, was working on a movie. Like the first movie that we did at Warner's was a movie called Quest for Camelot, and uh, you know, which turned out not to be a hit. And the studio was not super excited about doing more animation. Uh, but then, you know, they pretty much had everybody still, you know, under contract, and the studios had their contract for one year, so they pretty much, you know, like, well, what do we have, who do we have, uh, you know, and uh, it turns out, there was this guy named Brad Bird, and uh, so he pitched his stake on the Iron Giant, and the studio was like, yeah, whatever, just, uh, you know, do whatever, <laughs> and just uh, turn off the light, the keys in the mailbox, and you guys are done. And which you know gave us you know a lot of freedom to make really the movie that Brad wanted. Um, and so the way I got involved is I was working on Quest, and um, so a lot of us did not know Brad Bird. Uh, he had worked on The Simpsons, and so we knew okay, there's this new guy he's coming from you know The Simpsons. We don't really know is he about feature animation, is he about TV? Who is this guy? We didn't know who he was, and he was working on this secret project. And like every week he was going to the dailies to look at the animation from Quest for Camelot and kind of see what he liked, what he didn't like. And so, you know, one by one we'd get calls, hey, do you want to come and meet with Brad and stuff like that. So I, I get the call, I was a supervising animator of Quest, and so I get the call and I came, you know, came to meet with Brad and Tony Fucilli, who was the head of animation. And the first thing I told Brad when I met him was like, dude, I've been cursing your name since I was 13 years old. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, you know, I've been doing animation since literally I was a little kid. And I always loved comics and animation, which is what I do now. I still do comics and animation. And, like, when I was 13 years old, I decided to do this animated version of uh, my favorite comic at the time, which was the, you know, The Spirit by Will Eisner. So I did this whole short film, and it was in the old days, of, you know, and so... One day I'm going, I go to the public library, which is the only place I could get any sort of information on animation. And, I, I, and there was this one magazine that came out like once every eight months or whatever. And they had this little news item in there that said, this is some guy named Brad Bird, you know, is going to do an animated movie of the, of the spirit. And I was like, I was 13, I was like, how dare you, that's my movie, who the hell do you think you are, right? So, and so I didn't know anything about Brad, but then 20 years later, right, I, you know, I... You know, I met this guy, and the name I stuck with, like, it was the spirit just in my movie. So I told him that we bonded over our love for the spirit and, and, you know, that kind of stuff. But which also brings me to why I was so... Because the thing is, here's what happened. So I had the meeting with Brad, and then at some point we got invited to go to the theater and watch his first cut of the first act of the movie on Story Reels. And I saw the movie, and I was blown away. <laughs> Uh, and the reason for that, because of course it was all the stuff that I, that I always loved, you know, all the, the, you know, the 50s, the Cold War spy stuff, you know, by way of the X-Files almost, so that was really, really exciting. But most importantly, it's like I've, I've been doing animation literally since I was six years old, uh, so I love the art form. But sometimes, honestly, I feel like animated movies are kind of hard to take, because there's such, so much tropes to them, right? And, uh, uh, and so for the first time I saw a feature uh, animated movie that uh, not only touched on the subjects and themes that I was passionate about, but also I felt like it was not an animated movie. It was a movie. 
that just happen to be animated. And that, that trickled down to every aspect of the creation of this movie. And that was why I, I feel like not only did I learn so much from Brad working with him, but also just it was a touchstone in my professional uh, experience and experience in general. So that's all like the talking I want to do at first. And I know you guys are going to have a lot of questions on your agenda, so I'm just going to open it up to questions and we'll take it from there. But I can't see anyone. So. Hi, I'm, wow, that got really loud. Okay. Hi there. Uh, thank you for coming today. I just want to thank you for all of your contributions, including like with Balto, uh, How to Train Your Dragon, uh, Space Jam. You are awesome. Thank you so much for contributing to my childhood. Oh, thank you so much. I'm just gonna jump in there, and I, I'm gonna say that. How to Train Your Dragon is a movie that I have absolutely nothing to do with. Oh really? Yes. I remember on your IMDb it says it's a story. I know, it's like three times I, I didn't take it out. But the reason why is because I worked on it for like, I was doing something else for DreamWorks and I was okay. like, I had two weeks left and I thought they were gonna like, okay, we'll pay you your two weeks, just go home. And they said, no, actually we have a sequence for you. So I worked on it, it was like even not the final version of the movie. So I mean, that's, I'm just for the record, I'm just saying, I can't take credit for that wonderful movie. I was just thinking that question. Uh, so, with this kind of rising kind of resurgence of yeah. Iron Giant, and I've been seeing other revivals taking place, do you think there would ever be hopes of like a sequel or is it coming back? It's you know, it's very hard to to know. I mean, I'm not in the, I don't work at Warner Brothers anymore, so I don't have any inside any inside info on this. Um, the, the, the reality of the Iron Giant is that it's always been sort of an orphan project. Um, and I'm going to answer your question with a, in a roundabout way, so you understand like the context for my answer. Uh, you know, a lot of people will say, um, oh, it's too bad that Warner Brothers didn't promote that movie, like they didn't care about it when it came out, and it was really like, uh, a lot of people missed out on seeing it on the th in the theaters back then. And the reality is that, the reason they didn't care is the only reason that movie exists at all. Because had they cared in the least, we would have made like Quest for Camelot number two. <laughs> Seriously. So like, so it was really a situation where they didn't care anymore. They knew they had one more movie that needed to get made, and they, you know, and they were there. So their lack of involvement uh, in it is why it is at all. Let alone why it is the way it is. So we have to take the good with the bad. But that being said, over the years, it's really interesting how so many people have found this movie and it's been such a big emotional touchstone for so many families, and yet Warner's never feel like they really, you know, fell in love with it and really push it, like, you know, but I, and I think it's because in, in the big studios, big corporations, uh, it's still about people and people champion their own projects. So that project for 20 years was like an orphan project that no one really sort of uh, to charge off, but my hunch, and again, I know nothing, is like with Ready Player One, that's obviously such a huge deal, and apparently, I have not seen the movie, but apparently, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a big presence in it, so uh, maybe then somebody at Warner will go, you know, like, okay, you know what, now I'm taking this under my wing and I'm going to champion this property and, and just do more with it, but until that happens, something like that happens, then projects are already move forward, but you know, I think there's a good shot now, but I, I, I don't have any insight into it, that's just my two cents. Yeah? Hi. With the amount of, of, of uh, free creativity you had on the project without Warner Brothers overseeing it, how much time was spent on, or how much time was spent on the transition from the draft boards of the animation and the character appearances to the sketching to the final cut. Yeah, it was actually a very quick turnaround. The entire movie was done in a year or less. Uh, I think the animation itself was done in something like nine months, which is, you know, for a, a 2D animated movie uh, at that time was really, really short and really, um, really intense. And also, uh, this was the first time where you really had CG, because CG was really new at the time, right? I mean. Uh, and so you had movies that were full CG, like I think uh, Quest for Camelot, uh, uh, Toy Story, <laughs> nothing to do with it. 
uh, Toy Story had come out at the time already, so that you know, and even like movies like Anastasia, you know, had CG element, but they weren't really well integrated. They feel like they were learning a little bit. So very early, Brian wanted to make sure that we took advantage of CG for the giant, because for and also for vehicles and that kind of stuff, but that it would be completely integrated in the image. So the choice, you know, was to render instead of render it as a volume, it was tune rendered with lines so that it fit better into the animation. Uh, but that, what was really interesting too is that it, it was still the beginning of CG, so 2D animators didn't know how to use CG, and a lot of the CG people were still technical people who didn't really know how to put sequences together and stuff like that. So there was a very interesting, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, learning curve from these two groups of people who learned to work together on this. I actually was supervising the first sequence that came in production that had. Uh, Hogarth and the giant, that was the sequence when uh, he's trying to get the giant to fix the train tracks before the train comes in. Uh, and so it was really, really weird, you know, the, I, I didn't work on the boards for the, the movie, I just worked on animation. But, uh, you know, the sequence went from storyboards to, uh, to CG, uh, to the technical director's CG layouts. And when the, the sequence came back, I started to look at all the well, at the, you know, when you do work in 2D animation, it's all about folders full of drawings, so you open those folders. And I was like looking at those shots, and I felt like, oh, they're not cut. That doesn't cut. I just, what is this sequence, right? And so I called him Brad, and we looked at everything, and it turns out that the CG uh, tech guys had just ever so slightly changed everything, every, just ever so slightly, but the combination was like the sequence was not cutting together. So we called them in and said, hey guys, you know, just so you know, this is what we're looking for, da, da, da. and very quickly everybody got on the same page. But it was really interesting because we were all learning, people who knew the tools were learning the new language, and people who knew the language were learning the tools, so it was a very interesting learning process for everybody. I was wondering how you felt about the reception to the movie nowadays, particularly with the prominence of the character in Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, the, you know, my jokey way to 